you've heard the phrase, software is eating the world. And I forget who, who said that quote. Um, but is the same thing happening with decentralized finance? Is decentralized finance going to eat traditional finance? And just how do we, how do we focus on that adoption? This is, uh, this is a good, this is a good Jack section. I'll let him take it. Yeah, sure. So I am a sucker for history. And when I want to predict how the future looks, I want to look back at the past. The comparable history that I think DeFi should learn from is, well, the most obvious one is how traditional finance evolved and the financial innovations and history and the cycle of bubbles. But on the other hand, because when it comes to real world asset, um, we're kind of assuming like it's blockchain, not crypto, right? It's more like, okay, we're using blockchain streamline some of the financing workflow. And the intuitive comparable that jumped to me is enterprise software. And one of the largest innovation in enterprise software is the adoption of the cloud. Um, and the truth is, the cloud has been talking you know, for the past decade or even 20 years, and it's still happening. And there's still a debate about serverless architecture versus on-prem computing both at the technical level and the financial cost and the economics of it. And so if we can apply that to and start to predict how DeFi will eat traditional finance, then probably TriFi and DeFi will live together. They will coexist, similar to how in the real world right now in software, uh, cloud computing and on-prem uh, computing kind of coexist and it's um, there's no clear cut. There's no like proponents of either side will say, Hey, you know, cloud computing is the world, but then someone will show the economics and the cost of it and be like, well, in the long run, it's like, it's not necessarily that cheap. Um, and so I think that's how we view about this, but we have specific predictions that we laid out in the primer. And the first one, very interestingly, is, uh, what TJ proposed, uh, DeFi eats long tail assets first. Um, TJ, um, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, so this idea of um, running two systems in parallel, server and serverless architecture, um, is a great analogy for our rebirth assets, right? For traditional assets, for traditional managers, they're going to do the vast majority of their business through traditional avenues for the foreseeable future. It's what they know, it works, but they're going to start to dabble um, with acquiring assets via crypto protocols, with funding their own assets that currently sit on their books via crypto protocols, slowly but surely. So they're gonna pay fees for two systems. But we really think where crypto will make the biggest dent out of the gate is in the long tail of assets. So this is the underserved sectors of the economy broadly, whether jurisdictionally, asset class, borrower type, etc. These groups are far more likely to benefit from plugging into crypto than uh, their traditional counterparts. They have far, far, far more to gain, right? And by virtue of that, we expect to see the progress in the short and medium term be disproportionately skewed towards that long tail. And TJ, you have this very nice uh, two times two matrix. Um, DeFi eats the long tail speculative uh, developing first. What does that matrix mean and what motivated you to make that matrix? When we think about what sort of the long tail looks like, it can be along two dimensions. So an X and a Y axis. Uh, one dimension is gonna kind of be geographical, right? So we have the G7 world developed and then we have the rest of the world, which is emerging, right? And presumably for most asset classes, all else equal, if they are domiciled in an economy or in a jurisdiction like the US, they're gonna be much safer than if they're domiciled in a jurisdiction like Uganda, right? So that's, so let's say, our, our y-axis. On the x-axis, we also have, we're going from emerging asset classes to established asset classes, from risky asset classes to fairly safe asset classes. So on the x-axis on the far right, we'd have the safest asset classes, such as U.S. government securities. On the far left, in emerging asset classes, we'd have something like 
you know, lending against a coffee farm in Indonesia, right? And so in general, we're going to find ourselves um, with crypto making the greatest impact today, tomorrow, and the next day at this combination, this XY combo of emerging jurisdiction, emerging asset class. And it's going to take much longer for crypto to attack and make a dent on the exact opposite XY, which is to say very established jurisdiction, very established low risk asset class. Yeah, I think something else y'all y'all topped on touched on in, in terms of adoption is like it, unless DeFi is 10x better or more efficient than traditional finance, these institutions or I guess money managers are going to remain hesitant on that. Um, so I, I don't know. I was just wondering if you could if you could touch on that a, a little bit as well. Yeah. So we have a we actually in the, in the last section in the dialectic we have a cost curve. So happy to sort of mention in detail when we come to that section. Yeah, sure. Uh, but in short, basically the idea is special cost. You know, similar to you know, you, I'm using a iPhone and you want to convince me to use a Samsung. Well, I've got everything set up on my iPhone, on my iCloud, the photos, and iMessage. You know, is Samsung 10x better than what I'm using? If it's just marginally better, have a better camera, maybe 20% longer battery life, I'll be, I would hesitate. That's the intuition. 